Well, good morning, Foundry Church. My name is Phil. Eric is off on assignment, and by assignment, we mean rest and relaxation. Eric, if you're listening to this via podcast, you're in big trouble. That's not R&R. We specifically gave him the assignment of 27 different ice cream locations across the state, so hopefully he comes back with a good report. But uh, do pray for your pastor and Erica and their kids that they can just just have that rest, have that Sabbath, and, and come back to this place refreshed. But again, great to be with you this morning. I got to be here two weeks ago. If I didn't get a chance to meet you then, good morning. So Wild Card Sunday, we're taking a brief hiatus from our Joseph series to just talk about kind of whatever. And they said it's open-ended. And so I wanted to talk about one of my all-time favorite passages from Philippians chapter 2. And the question on the premise this morning, Foundry, is simply asking this. What is it that would keep you as a church united? What is it that kept the church in Philippi united? What is it that would keep the Foundry Church united? And to do that, we're going to look at what Paul wrote to this church in Philippi. And we'll be in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It'll be on your screen, or feel free to read along in Scripture as we dive in. Philippians 2, 1 through 11 starts with this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others." You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And it concludes with this. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen to that. So if you grew up in the 1980s like I did, you may have been highly influenced by such pivotal films as The Goonies or Star Wars. And so growing up in East Lansing, we had a little tiny street that was kind of off the beaten path from the rest of the neighborhoods called Harkson Drive, and like most isolated streets, there was a group of kids growing up on the street, and we did what kids naturally do. We formed a little biker gang. It was called the Venom Street Gang. Now, it sounds intimidating. I don't want you to be scared. The Venom Street Gang, basically all we did was ride our bikes up and down the street. Eventually, we'd work our way to 7-Eleven for a pack of baseball cards and the Slurpees, but that's all we did the Venom Street Gang. However, every neighborhood biker gang needs what? They need a home base. They need a fort. So we had, uh, we had been you know, prowling the neighborhood. We had had a couple other forts, but one day across the street, there was this vacant commercial property, and it had this magnificent tree. And we're like, all right, Venom Street Gang, home base. We found our fort. We claimed it. We're doing what the, the neighborhood kids do. We're hauling junk and any scrap that we can find to build this tree fort. And then one day, someone had the audacity to challenge the sovereignty of the Venom Street Gang. So we get to our fort, and we find just one piece of paper nailed, like Martin Luther, nailed into our tree. And apparently, get this, McNeil Family Dentistry also thought they owned that land that was clearly the property of the Venom Street Gang. They wanted to build this dental office and we weren't having it. So the note basically gave us 24 hours to get all of our junk off the property before it was bulldozed. And now we have a worthy adversary. So the Venom Street Gang, we're, we're meeting as 10-year-olds do, and we're deciding what to do. We came up with a brilliant plan. We we're going to fight back. Goonies never say die, neither does the Venom Street Gang. So armed with our best Crayola marker, we walked right up to that eviction notice and we just wrote two words. That was all that was necessary. And I don't think we spelled either word correctly. It doesn't matter. But we wrote phony baloney. And then we turned and ran, right? Like bulldozers are coming and we're like, okay, this will teach them. 
phony baloney. Uh, and so we had about 24 hours to think about the ramifications of this war that we've just begun with the construction company. And I won't lie to you, the, the unity of the Venom Street Gang was severely challenged. We started fraying at the seams. There were some that thought we should stay and fight, others turn and run. And uh, we came back the next day, and the tree fort was gone entirely, bulldozed, just remnants of branches broken and scattered. But, however, to this day, you can still get your teeth cleaned at McNeil Family Dentistry. <laughs> the point is, we as people are very good at creating our own tiny kingdoms and little worlds. And we start these tiny kingdoms at a young age, don't we? Maybe it's tree forts. Maybe you had your tree fort that you think back on finally. Maybe your tiny world is something online like Farmville or my daughter's favorite, Dragonvale. Maybe it's growing up, you had your Lego world that you cultivated and cared for and your Lego kingdom expanded. Maybe it's more something futuristic. Maybe you're the Elon Musk type and you think about colonizing Mars and you think, what a cool opportunity to build a tiny kingdom in space. And while we love to create new worlds and tiny kingdoms, we find a particular disturbing trend always at work. What starts as something unified always drifts to disunified. We always go from unity to division. And what was once unified quickly starts to unravel. I read about a man in, in preparing for this. His name was James Strang. Anybody here ever been to Beaver Island? So this man named James Strang, in, in 1850, he claimed Beaver Island in Lake Michigan, tiny island, as his own sovereign Mormon kingdom, right? He literally claimed to be the sovereign king of Beaver Island, and he tried to set up his own government. At one point, he had over 12,000 followers at, at his disposal. He was known simply as the pirate king of Beaver Island, and he was stealing land and goods from the Christians, and he even fired a cannon at Irish settlers in the Battle of Whiskey Point. Fascinating. However, our federal government, much like the construction company with the Venom Street Gang, didn't recognize the sovereignty of King Strang on Beaver Island, and his little world also came crashing down, and his followers were dispersed after his assassination by the federal government. United to divided, we get the trend. Even Disney World, I'm told, I don't know this firsthand, even Disney World supposedly has a jail underground, which I find so fascinating. United to divided. So whether it's something small like a group of friends or a team or something like a business or even a country, we know this trend all too well. We know disunified, we know fractured, and our churches know it too. And you won't be able to study church history for more than 10 hot seconds before you realized just how disunified the church has been. Gordon Conwell Seminary recently published an article that said we have over 47,000 different denominations of Christians. 47,000, which tells you what? That we have a long and rich history of being disunified. And so in our text this morning, Foundry Church, Paul is asking a seminal question to this young church in Philippi. He's saying, what is it that would cause you to actually stay together? What is it that would cause you to ride this thing out in closeness and stick it out? And as we shift to asking the same question, how would you as the Foundry, as you grow, love, and serve together, what is it that would keep the Foundry Church united? Honestly, I hate church shopping. I hate that that's even a term. I love when people are like, this is my church. This is my home. For better or worse, we're going to ride this thing out with this family of believers. I love that sense. And so when the trend is to go from unified to divided, what is that would actually keep the Foundry Church together? Actually functioning as one. What is it that would cause you to do the impossible and stick it out and be one of those churches that were like, we're just in it together. This is our church family. We're not going anywhere. So Paul has a great answer to this, and we'll get to that. It's almost like this dark joke I heard, speaking of our disunity. I get it. I get dark humor. But the joke is about two men on a bridge, and it goes like this. I was walking across a bridge one day, and I saw a man standing on the edge about to jump. I would immediately ran over and said, stop, don't do it. Why shouldn't I, he said. I said, well, there's so much to live for. 
Like what? Well, are you religious or atheist? Religious, the man answered. Me too. Are you, are you Christian or are you Jewish? Christian. Me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? Protestant. Me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? Baptist. Wow, me too. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God or are you Reformed Baptist Church of God? Reformed Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879 or Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 19. To which I said, die, heretic scum, and pushed him off. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not really funny, and I get the dark humor of it all, but it penetrates us because it actually shows us, again, how disunified the, the church has been. It's kind of a sad admission of the reality we actually know is going on. Just a little bit too much truth in that. So you see why we need to lean into this issue of, of church unity and Christian unity head on. And Paul lays out this blueprint in Scripture, and it has so much to offer the Philippian church, but I believe it has so much to offer you as the foundry. So let's unpack it, starting in verses 1 through 2. Here's the blueprint for Christian unity. I'm going to go back to this, this first section on it. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, and if any common sharing in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. He is basically offering the church his plea. He's saying, I'm going to pour my heart out first. Let me just, let me just spew and wear my heart on my sleeve and just, just give it to you straight up. He says this is actually, his plea is so huge, he's actually saying in verse 2, my joy would be complete. This is a really big ask of Paul. He's saying this is what would make me the most happiest as a church planter. If you guys did this, there would nothing else would make me happier in the whole world. And so unity is a big deal. He starts with this personal appeal, and it's basically saying this. If you've gotten anything out of this relationship with Christ... If his love has made any difference in your life, if being in community in the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, then do these four things. It's this if-then banter. It's begging for a response. He's saying, if these things are true, then you should be doing these things. It's this appeal to both the head and the heart. So what are the four things that he wanted the church to do? One, be like-minded. Two, have the same love. Three, be of one accord Four, have a unity about them. Appealing both to the head and the heart. Be like-minded. There's the head. Have the same love. There's the heart. And you go through this checklist. Here's the loose summary of this. A church in agreement. He's saying, if you can be deep-spirited friends in a church in agreement, then my joy would be complete. And you get to this appeal and you're like, okay, if I had any... Any encouragement from being united in Christ? Check. Yeah, of course I have. Have I had any comfort from his love? Any common sharing in the spirit? If you have a heart, if you care, if this church has meant anything to you, then do these things. Be of like mind. Have the same love. Be of one accord. Have unity. And I think his appeal works. But he appeals to them. But he also kind of knows that this is a really tough ask, right? And he doesn't just leave them with an appeal. It's not just like, unity is really important to me. Please do this. He actually spells out how to do this. He gives them concrete, specific things. Have you ever thought about it like this? If, uh, if, like, if Christianity was like math and you had to master section 2.7 before you went on to section 2.8, I would be so stuck on this blueprint because it's that challenging, so he goes on to give them this blueprint in verses 3 through 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Again, if this was the math lesson, I'm not sure I graduate from Philippians 2-3. That's tough. Let's just be honest about it. Each of you should not look to only your own interests, but also the interests of others. Whew. It's tough. Like, if we're really honest, we're like, 
this almost, this almost seems impossible, right? How do we actually do this? As, a, as I was studying for this, I found one theologian who just nailed it in his commentary. I was reading up, and he said this. It was from the William Barclay Bible Commentary. He wrote, To be admired, to be respected, to have a platform seat, to have one's opinion sought, to be known by name and appearance, to be listened to, to have a certain degree of fame, to even be flattered, are for many people most desirable things. But the aim of the Christian is not self-display, but (laughs) self-obliteration. Nailed it. But again, it doesn't make it any easier. Self-obliteration, I love that. This is what we're called to. Christian missionary Jim Elliott in the 1950s said it a different way. He said, we are a bunch of nobodies trying to exalt somebody. But if you've seen this done, I wish, honestly, we had an open mic that we could pass and to say, when you've seen this lived out, it is uniting. It does pull you back to Christ. It does show you some type of revolutionary love that you can't really explain. And if we had an open mic, I would love to hear the stories of people who have embodied Philippians 2, 3, and 4. We could spend days just sharing those examples, and we'd leave here all jacked up because it is that inspiring. It is that unifying when it is actually lived out. I've seen it lived out. If you mention the name Rich Mullins, if you grew up in a conservative Christian home in the 1980s or 1990s, you have one of two responses when you hear the name Rich Mullins. You're like, oh, isn't he the guy that wrote that awesome God song? Like, we had in the 80s and 90s, like, go-to worship songs like we do now, like Oceans. But he wrote this song called Awesome God, and it was way overplayed for, like, 10 years. Great song, but, but that's how some people know Rich Mullins. But then there's another group that knew Rich as this humble, devoted Christ follower and just would have nothing bad to say about the man. But here's the thing, if you were to ask the, the question, where was Rich Mullins in the, the mid to late 1990s, he wasn't in Nashville continuing to pump out records. Rich was actually on the Navajo Indian Reservation in New Mexico. He left fame for obscurity, finding that he flourished on the reservation way more than he did in Nashville. And this wasn't a publicity stunt, that's usually the pushback is like, Yeah, I'm sure he probably would sell more records if they thought he was so charitable and here's his work with the Native Americans. And he actually laughed at that idea. He's like, I'm just trying to live out my faith with fear and trembling. That's why he said he moved to New Mexico. But if you ask the question, where's Rich? Free concerts to inmates. He was teaching school on the reservation and the school had no instruments, no music program, and not even a music stand. That's where he was. This former Dove-nominated Songwriter of the Year was more than happy to give freely. At a time when Christian music was becoming a multi-billion dollar industry, Rich was one of its reluctant pioneers. He apparently, this shocks me, he had no idea how much money he actually made. He didn't want to know, and he told his accountant not to tell him, but only to pay him whatever the average American salary was of 1994 and give the rest away to charities and churches. It's, it's Philippians 2, 3 through 4, is it? So many great stories about Rich. I've also seen it in the life of Rose Mapendo. Also going back to the late 1990s. But on August 2nd, 1998, the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo ordered the genocide of the Tutsi people. Rose and her family were Tutsi, also predominantly Christian people. Rose suffered greatly after her husband was tortured and executed in the genocide. Rose was taken with nine of her ten children to a death camp where she spent almost a year and a half suffering in unimaginable conditions. Abuse, starvation, 32 women and children in a single prison cell with no toilet. Survival seemed pretty bleak. And Rose, she was pregnant with twins. And when the time came for her to deliver the twins on that filthy concrete floor of her prison cell, It was a nightmare. In the dark, she had to use a piece of wood to cut the umbilical cords, and she gave birth to her twins. And in an act of what I can only describe as gospel insanity, she named her twins after two of the prison guards who had beaten her. 
She gave a position of honor to men who deserve not a single ounce of honor. And you see that and you're like, there it is again, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. I've seen it in the life of, of this man, Robert Taylor. He was a chaplain during World War II. He was in the uh, Pacific Theater, this lanky, red-haired Texan preacher. And uh, in the Philippines, he, his unit was captured, and they had to endure the horrific Bataan Death March. When he tried to help his fellow POWs end their suffering along that grueling 60-mile death march, he also suffered beatings and torture. He was then, after he survived the Bataan Death March, he was then a prisoner at a horrific POW camp called Cabana Chuan, one of the largest and most brutal POW camps in all of the Philippines. It was here that Taylor did the unthinkable, just unfathomable to me what goes on. In this POW camp, he volunteered as a chaplain to serve in the Zero Ward at the POW camp. They called it the Zero Ward because that was your chance to live. They called it the Zero Ward because they had zero supplies, zero hope. In fact, your average life expectancy in this hospital, that's a very generous term, was 19 days. And in June of 1942, Robert Taylor saw over 500 Americans die in the Zero Ward in one month. In July of 1942, it was 800. And as a chaplain, not as a doctor, but as a chaplain, here was Robert Taylor ministering to the terminally ill, risking his own life by living in daily exposure to contagious diseases. Not only was he living in the Zero Ward and ministering, but he was also smuggling in supplies. I love this about the man. To make sure that people could stay alive for just a few more days, he would meet with spies on the outside and smuggle goods into the camp. It was said that Chaplain Taylor was the only man at Cabana Chuan to whom you could give a glass of powdered milk intended for the sick and know with perfect assurance it would reach the hospital untouched. When one of the spies, who simply went by the name High Pockets, asked Captain Taylor or Chaplain Taylor what he wanted, he said, I'm basically good. They're living on a ball of rice, 50 calories a day. And he's smuggling supplies in to desperate men, not taking an ounce for himself. He actually had the audacity to ask the spy to smuggle him in a Greek New Testament. That was his one request, was a Greek New Testament Bible. In the Zero War, he was remembered for turning prayer into an athletic act. Taylor conducted last rites and burial ceremonies by the hundreds, if not the thousands. He was a huge influence on the camp, said Tommy Thomas. Everyone knew him, respected him, and what a great line. Wherever people were most in need, that's where you'd find him. Oh. Now, generally when someone stands up in a pulpit and they share examples that are oftentimes inspirational, there's usually pushback. And the pushback is like, well, Phil, that's not my context. That's not my story. And it's not my context or my story either. And it doesn't make it any easier. You put up these legendary examples of like a, a Mother Teresa, and you're like, I'm not a Mother Teresa. Don't put Mother Teresa on the screen. I get that. It's not our context. And it doesn't make it any easier. And Paul seems to be a step ahead of us. And I love that about him. It's almost that like he knows that if he writes, if he writes something as audacious as what he writes in verses 3 and 4, in order to digest and live out such daunting commands, he knows what we need most. And that is a living an active understanding of Christ's humility. So he gives us the summation. He gives us the cornerstone. He gives us the final measure of what's really going to take for us to have unity. And that's to think of ourselves as Christ thought of himself. So we go back to the closing of this chapter, of this section in verse 5. He says it this way. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took on the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. 
Therefore God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's like what Paul is saying is that if this seems too hard to actually pull off, if unity seems really like this illusion that's out there that churches fill, they're never really unified, let's be honest. Like, name a church that's actually really unified. But Paul's saying, look, if you have this attitude, this is what it's going to take. Because this is otherworldly in the sense that we look to Christ fully God and fully man to do this. Only someone who could be fully God and fully man could actually show us how to do this. That's how otherworldly it is. So he enters our world, or as the message says, he moved into the neighborhood. And it's only his attitude that would allow us to actually pull this thing off. We only do this by learning from the master, the only true king. So Foundry, do you want to stay unified? Then think of yourselves the same way Christ did. Otherworldly love, otherworldly humility. I almost typed out humidity yesterday. Otherworldly unity. It's the only thing that's going to level the playing field. Because Paul seems to know this trend. He, he knows we always go from divided or from united to divided. But he also knows how easy it is for us to lean into selfishness. What's my default gear? My default gear is selfishness. My default gear is me, myself, and I. Right? Or rather to become little kings and little queens, little tyrants of our own little tiny kingdoms to fight for our own rights, to steal the spotlight and claim our own 15 minutes, to market our own brand. Isn't that what social media has just become? Self-promotion and marketing. I mean, it's just, it's just self-promotion at any cost right now. And when we look to Christ, we liberate ourselves from ourselves. It is a whole new world. It's a new kingdom with a different economy. The pattern of this new kingdom is a total reversal of everything the world holds dear. You want your power, your comfort, your success, and your recognition, and the kingdom of Christ inverts that and flips it, and it's subversive. And it changes everything. And as we close, maybe it would help to think of it like this. This is a really valuable exercise in unity. It's tough. But a writer named Alan Jacobs in his book, How to Think, he borrowed this great phrase from anthropologists, and the phrase is, your repugnant cultural other. Your repugnant cultural other. You've got a repugnant cultural other, as do I. Who is your repugnant cultural other? It's not just the person you disagree with. It's the person on the opposite end of the spectrum, and in that person, they embody everything you disagree with. It's not just that you don't like them. It's what you think that they stand for, what they spew, what they believe, it's actually dangerous. It's actually harming the United States. It's actually harming the church. It's actually harming anything you hold valuable. That is your repugnant cultural other. And if you follow Christ, that is your neighbor. This is the supreme ethic of our Christ. To love our neighbor, and Christ even takes it a step further, to love your enemy. And so Paul's trying to process this in Philippians 2. He's saying, are you processing people with the same attitude of Christ? Your repugnant cultural other, you know why you have to process them with the same attitude of Christ? Because even granting personhood to them, if we were honest, seems hard. When you think about that person on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're like, they're not even human to me. Like, there's something far worse. And this lens of Philippians 2, it's like, we don't, we don't play that card, not with the attitude of Christ, considering he who became a servant was obedient even into death, then what? Then you don't get to start dealing with your own self-rights. Our standing as the church is as forgiven. Our standing is by grace and grace alone. And now unity can happen. Well, why? Why does that promote liberty? Or why does that promote unity? Because Foundry, here's the closing of it. If you've been forgiven everything and you stand before Christ only on the merits of his obedience in going to the cross, then everything is grace. Everything is unmerited. So this kingdom of Jesus really must be otherworldly because it, has, it just doesn't sound human at all. How could we actually do this? There is no such thing as your repugnant cultural other in the economy of Christ because it's all grace. It's all forgiveness. We have zero right to hold on to any moral superiority. And it all goes out the window because we've been forgiven everything. 
This proper understanding of the gospel levels us, but it also in the same breath lifts us up because we know we brought nothing to the table and it's all grace and it's all mercy and it's all forgiveness and it's all by Christ and his death on the cross. And at the same breath, it lifts us up to the stars because we realize how much we are loved by this Messiah. And if you understand this proper gospel of salvation that we brought nothing to this, it gives you a security and a hope and a stability that is utterly out of keeping in the world that we live in right now. Like I said, when you see an example of somebody living out Philippians 2, you're like, it looks otherworldly because it is. But people who have that proper understanding of being lifted down where it's just grace and mercy and forgiveness and also lifted up knowing that they're fully loved, those are the people who can be real agents of unity. And it doesn't mitigate the risk. The people can still hurt you. But humility, catch this foundry, humility and conviction are not opposites. You can walk in humility and in conviction. You can walk in love and unity and still stand for biblical truth. Unity can still include confrontation and tough conversations. And in his grace, we find the one love that could actually unite us in all of our ridiculous, tiny little kingdoms. So as we close and invite the band to come back up to to close us in worship, Foundry, for you as a young church, as a five-year-old church, you have a great challenge ahead of you to grow into unity. Unity was important enough for Paul to give this personal appeal. And it was important enough to Christ that in the Garden of Gethsemane, his final prayer that somebody was eavesdropping on was Christ pouring out his heart saying, Father, I want them. You're included in that, the foundry. I want them to be one as you and I are one. Christ is in the garden sweating drops of blood about to go to his death and he's praying for the unity of the church. He's praying for 47,000 different denominations of Christians. So it's a noble calling, and it seems so daunting, and I get it. It seems hard at times. It seems almost impossible at times, but Foundry, go hard after it. Love like crazy. Take that same attitude of Christ. Elevate one another's as being better than yourselves. Love like the playing field really was leveled by grace. And watch, just try it. Watch how you will flourish as a church if you decide to lock arms and stay unified as a church. Because you will showcase this counterintuitive, countercultural love that the world goes, what the heck is going on there? How do you guys love like that? How do you guys be of one mind and one accord? You're still going to have disagreements. That's, we all know that. But when these tiny worlds and little kingdoms fall by the wayside, when they're rendered obsolete by his worth and its glory, it's so amazing. It's the church that you would really, really want to be a part of that would accomplish your mission statement to make Christ known throughout Zealand and Holland. So let me close in prayer and we'll keep worshiping. Father, as always, your, your words challenge us. We need your strength. We need the attitude of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us the way to do this. Thank you for showing us that we brought nothing to the table, and it's it's all through unmerited grace and favor. It's all through amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved wretches like us. I pray, Lord, for this church, that they would be a bunch of nobodies just trying to exalt you, the somebody. I pray for self-obliteration to happen in this place, Father, where egos can be dropped at the door and we can lift one another up and showcase to the world this crazy love that really looks otherworldly. Give us the strength and grace to do that, Father. In your son's name we pray, amen. Oftentimes it's uh, easy for ministers and people in pulpits to pull things out of context, and context matters. If I were to have read the passage before Philippians 2, Paul is telling this young church in Philippi, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. There's that otherworldliness. Conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. 
Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, you will know that you are standing side by side fighting together, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. So that's my blessing for you, Foundry Church, Philippians 1.27. May you, above all, live as citizens of heaven. May you conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, standing side by side, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Have a great week, a happy 4th of July, and uh, may the Freon be plentiful wherever you end up today. God's blessing. Go in grace and peace. You're dismissed.